holy moly, there are a lot of molecules. Thank goodness we have molarity to help bring some clarity into this molecular hilarity. So molarity is a measure of concentration. It's equal to moles per liter. And a mole is 6.02 to 3 blah, 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 times 10 to the 23rd. It's Avogadro's number. It's kind of like a biochemist dozen, except that it's a huge, huge number. And if we were to order a mole's worth of bagels, we would have enough for 86 trillion bagels per person. So, but because we're dealing with such tiny, 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 tiny things in biochemistry, this mole actually makes sense and it helps make things a lot easier when we're talking in terms of concentration. We can talk about how many molecules there are in a given volume in moles per liter. Sometimes we want to use other units of concentration. So we have additional um, concentration units such as we can talk about molality, we can talk about mole fraction, um, we can talk about osmolality, we can talk about, there's some unofficially type ones like percent weight volume. So today I want to tell you more about these units of concentration and when they come into play, when to use what, how to convert between units and that sort of thing. So let's dive in. So let's start by defining a mole, which it turns out is not as simple as it would seem. And it's actually something that's been debated for quite some time. So the mole as of this new definition um, announced in 2018 is that a mole contains exactly 6.022214076 times 10 to the 23rd elementary entities. This number is the fixed numerical value of the Avogadro constant, um, it, which is, um, so this Avogadro number. And so this, the mole is now defined in terms of this exact number, so it's not tied to any one thing. The old definition was tied to the weight of carbon 12. Um, so basically it was saying that the mole is the amount of substance of a system which contains as many elementary entities as there are atoms in 0.012 kilograms of carbon 12. So in 12 grams of carbon 12, there are a mole's worth of atoms. And this is um, this is consistent with the fact that carbon-12 has 12 nucleons, so it has six protons and six electrons, and thus each of those nucleons would have a mass of one grams per mole. For all practical extents and purposes, uh, we can use this term Dalton, this unit Dalton, to mean a gram per mole. Um, this is sometimes called an atomic mass unit. So, for example, if something has a molecular weight, if something has a molecular weight of say 342.3, this means 342.3 grams, grams per mole. So that would be like 342.3 Daltons. In biochemistry, we're often dealing with um, proteins. And so proteins, often we talk about their masses in terms of kilodaltons. So they're heavier than just those sucrose units. So if we want to talk about how much a mole of something weighs, then we're often talking in kilodaltons. And so we can put these various prefixes in front of um, daltons, in front of moles, in front of all of these different things. And so a kilo is like a thousand. And so we can talk about a kilodalton is a thousand grams per mole or one kilograms per mole. There's about 10 amino acids per kilodalton. So if you had say a 25 kilodalton protein, that would be about 250 amino acids and the 100 kilodalton protein would be about a thousand amino acids. Um, and so this is basically saying that if you have a 100 kilodalton protein, so it's got about a thousand amino acids and it's gonna weigh 100 grams, 100 kilograms per mole. So why am I talking so much about this idea of the mole is because it's really important when we're talking about determining concentrations in terms of the absolute numbers of things. So we can, if we want to talk about the absolute numbers of things, then we need to be able to have a way to convert between the numbers of those things and some quantity that we can more easily measure like mass. So the original definition of the mole, the um, based on the mass of carbon, it, it's still basically true. Um, it's slightly, the definition by putting it something so exact, it takes it away from this 
being tied to the kilogram, especially, um, so there's problems with the kilogram, including, so this is a good article if you want to learn more. There's some problems with using the kilogram, including the fact that like the gold standard kilogram is actually like, it's chain mass changes like infinitesimally, which doesn't seem like that big of a thing. But when you're talking about these constants that are what are supposed to be constants that things rely on, then those tiny little changes can have a big effect. Also, there's things like if it's talking about the number of entities of something, then it shouldn't be, then it needs to be like a whole number. And then there are things like, well, if it's not really, so it's not really directly tied to mass of something, it's not a measure of mass. Mass is just this indirect way that we're getting the number of the things. And so basically, this is why they chose to use set this fixed constant for the mole. Um, so it's just an interesting story that I learned about. And so if you want to check it out, um, you can check out these articles that I will link to, but I'm not going to go too much further into it because I'm not a physicist and I don't want to mess anything up um, on the physics front. Because what I want to tell you about more is just how we use the mole to our advantage when we're talking about concentrations, especially in biochemistry. Uh, one last note. So in the technical definition, you can't, uh, the definition refers to elementary entities and therefore disallows application to other objects. Thus, technically, we cannot speak about a mole of stars, sand grains, or moles, the animals. But um, the I still like to think sometimes in terms of more practical or not, I guess, less practical, but if you were to talk about actual numbers of things, um, but thinking of moles in more general terms, it, this is often done, although it's not technically speaking um, true because these elementary entities are more, um, should be things like atoms and molecules and particles and various things. But I'm not gonna go into that. Okay, so in, you might think that like from our bagel example, how you'd have like 86 trillion bagels per person, that there are, the mole would be impracticably, impractically um, large, but because molecules are so tiny, the mole turns out to be really good for the types of things that we're often talking about. And so, for example, water, pure water has a molarity, so moles per liter of 55.5 um, molar. So there are about 30, over 33, um, thousand sextillion molecules per liter. So that's like, and 33 septil, um, so if this is so, so 33 septillion, so a trillion trillion molecules per liter, which is a lot, a lot, a lot of molecules of water. So water is a super, super, super duper um, concentrated thing in terms of water molecules, but we can also have other stuff in the water molecules. And so if we have a dilute solution where it's going to be mostly water, but then there's some, also some other stuff in there, and we'll talk about how much of that other, how we can define how much other stuff we have in there. But that other stuff is going to be less than 55 molar, and typically we're talking about things in the uh, millimolar, micromolar, nanomolar, this sort of range when we're dealing with um, biological, biochemical um, solutions. So in school, they often teach you more about the bigger stuff, and in Biochemistry, we're often talking about this really small stuff. Um, and so we're often, you will often use micro, nano, et cetera. But you can easily convert between these using dimensional analysis. And um, I have more on that on other posts. So I'm not gonna get into that here. So let's get back to talking about concentration. So the most common probably concentration that we use is molarity, which is moles per liter. And we use this because it directly relates the number of copies of a molecule. And this can be really important. So instead of talking about say grams per liter or something like that, which might, um, we'll talk about that a little later, but that, so that might be easier to measure out. But when you're talking about, because molecules have different sizes, now this is going to really influence things. So if you were to talk about a big protein versus a little protein, a mole's worth of each of them would be weigh a lot different. And so if you weighed out the same amount, you would have a lot more copies of the little guy than you'd have of the big guy. And so although it might not be as easy to, to measure out um, moles worth and that sort of thing, 
if we have a molecular weight, we can actually convert between them. So if we have this, like we know this is 100 kilodaltons, this is 25 kilodaltons. Or if we know, say, that sugar has a molecular weight of 342.3, now if we want one mole's worth of a sucrose solution, we can weigh out 342.3 grams and dissolve that into a mole, a liter of liquid. Or if we wanted to make a mole of molar tris, which is this buffer solution, it has a molecular weight of 121.14 grams per mole. And so we would divide, we would weigh out 121.14 grams and dissolve that in a liter. And we'd have to do a little other things because it's a buffer, we'd want to adjust the pH and stuff, but this would give us a one molar solution. So in those examples, we are kind of looking at things, concentrations in terms of weighing out what we put in or measuring out what we put in. But what if we care about what actually happens once it's inside? What if we care about how many things, how many copies of things there are inside versus what we put in? So by this, I mean that if we stick in something that's a non-electrolyte, so if we stick in something like sugar, what's gonna happen is that it's going to dissolve, meaning that it's going to get a full water coat. However, it's not going to dissociate. So it's not going to break apart into its individual glucose and fructose parts. But if we have an electrolyte, so we have like a salt that's going to dissolve when, and dissociate. So basically this, and it, so sodium chloride table salts is made up of both sodium ion. So in a chloride ion, this is positively charged, negatively charged, so they're kind of hanging out together, but they're not permanently stuck together. They're not stuck together with covalent bonds, they're just um, strongly attracted to one another through these ionic bonds. So when we stick these into water, these are going to dissolve and dissociate. So the sodium and the chloride are going to come apart. And therefore, once you put this into a solution, you're actually going to have twice as many particles as you put in. And this might not seem like a big deal, but it can be a big deal because it's going to influence colligative properties. So colligative properties depend on how many dissolved things there are. And so these colligative properties include things like boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, um, um, differences in osmotic pressure. And so these things can be really important. And so we need to have a way to account for this. And this is where a term called osmolality, or, or, this is where a term called osmolarity can come into play, which is looking at the number of those dissolved particles. So we use this factor called the Van at Hoff factor, where we can actually figure out, we can actually multiply something by the number of things that it's going to break into. So if you imagine that you had like a Kit Kat bar versus a Rollo bar, if the formula unit for it, so what you would measure out is like what you would buy it as. So what in the, if you were to look at the formula weight, um, so for like sucrose, you would see it was 342.3. And for sodium chloride, it would be 58.44. So this is telling you that in like one formula unit, so in one NACL, you'd have 58.44 grams per mole. However, once you once that dissociates, now your those are going to break up. And so you would, would then have as many, like you would have your Van at Hoff factor for this would be two, you would have two times as many things as you put in. If you had a rollo bar, say you would have seven times as many rollo pieces um, because this is dissociating. Whereas with like your Kit Kat bar, so with our sucrose, we're going to have a Van at Hoff factor of one. Um, it's not coming apart. So we get the same number of particles out as the number of particles that we put in. But you can also you would still have a mole's worth of sodium chloride, but you can also say that you have a mole's worth of sodium and a mole's worth of chloride. And so sometimes when you're, so when you're talking about colligative properties, like when you're talking about osmolarity and when you're talking about things like boiling point depression, when you have these dissolved particles, when you have more dissolved particles, these are going to influence the, um, the thing. So in my, those properties. And so you need to take those into account. So for example, yesterday in my post, I talked about osmotic pressure. 
And this is going to basically drive the movement of water or other solvent to a region where there is um, a higher concentration of solute. And just uh, more technical details in yesterday's post, but, tech, but this is actually going to depend on whether or not that solute can get through the barrier. But you can think of that the more dissolved things there are, the more water is typically going to flow towards the side with those dissolved things. If you have some sort of barrier, that's not letting those dissolved things through. So if you had sodium chloride here, you would have like twice as much power to draw the water as you would if you had dissolved sucrose. Similarly, um, if you have twice, if you have the sodium chloride, you'd have a bigger effect on the freezing point. Um, so lowering the freezing point, why we salt roads, um, and raising the boiling point, making it harder. You have to put in more energy in order to get the um, the water to boil. If you added a bunch of bunch of salt. So when we talk about osmolarity, we talk in terms of these dissolved particles and we're taking into account the Van et Hoff factor. So we're taking the molarity and multiplying it by the Van et Hoff factor, which is telling us how many things it's going to break into when it dissolves. Sometimes the molarity isn't enough though. Um, sometimes we need some other units. An example of another unit is molality. So molality is going to tell you about moles per um, kilogram of solvent. So we might think this is weird. Um, be not typically thinking about weighing out water, right? Um, but it turns out that this can be helpful because water um, is actually, the volume of things is typically going to increase as the temperature increases. So as you add energy, the molecules are going to have more energy to move apart from one another. And so they will. So the water is going to expand at a higher temperature. You might've noticed this if you have like a water bottle and it's a hot day and your water bottle starts bulging. Um, the water, is, so the water is taking up more room um, the, and there's some like evaporation and stuff. Um, but basically, the temperature with the temperature, the volume is going to increase, but the number of molecules and the weight is going to stay the same. So if we talk, we were to talk in terms of volume, now we would be getting fewer water molecules in a given volume. But if we talk in terms of weight, we would have to include more all of those water molecules. Um, if it, so we would have the same thing. So the, basically, the it, this isn't changing the the concentration you measure, if you want to have like, if you want to think in terms of copies of something per copy of water, then you would want to use a more consistent unit. Um, and so the molality is going to be consistent. Um, and the nice thing about water is that the, at room temperature, water has a molarity of 55.5 molars and a molality of 55.5 molars. Um, and it's only when you're going to a different temperature that you really need to worry about um, changes in this sort of thing. But often, um, so molality is used in some cases, but it's typically we're dealing with molarity in biochemistry. There are also some other things, other types of units that we sometimes see. So another type of concentration unit that we can use is the mole fraction. And this is telling you basically the moles of your thing divided by the moles of the total thing. So what part of the whole thing is your thing? So the more you have of a thing, the higher the mole fraction is going to be. So if half of your thing was a, was your, half of the solution was your thing, it would have a mole fraction of 0.5. If three quarters of the solution was your thing, it would have a mole fraction of 0.75. But typically we're dealing with a lot smaller mole fractions because remember water has that crazy, crazy high molarity of like 55 molar and the thing that you have dissolved in there is going to be a lot less. So for example, if you had one molar sucrose, that would be, um, we have 55.5 moles of water um, and one mole of sucrose and therefore we have one divided by 55.5 plus one. And so we would end up with a mole fraction of 0.015. If we had two molar sucrose, we can do the math and we get 0.035. If we add something else, now our mole fraction is going to go down. 
So another important thing to note about mole fraction is that when you have a, an electrolyte, so you have something that dissolves and dissociates like sodium chloride, then this is going to give you twice as much in terms of the mole fraction in terms of particles. And so this is going to come into effect again with those colligative properties where the mole fraction is going to be greater even if you put in the same molarity, even if the solution overall, it would have like a one molar sodium chloride solution, you really are dealing with a molar of sodium and a molar of chloride in your solution. And thus you have twice as many particles and you have twice as, um, big, twice as big of a molar fraction. And another thing to note is that for a gas, the mole fraction times the total pressure equals the partial pressure. Um, and so we, you might remember partial pressures from Dalton's law of partial pressures, which basically says that the overall pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures. So if you know the, um, if you know the mole fraction of something and you know the total pressure, then you can figure out its partial pressure. And if you know, um, yeah, so that's this. Okay, so now let's talk about a measure of concentration that I really don't like, but sometimes comes in handy. Um, this is this percent weight volume. And so there are some like relative concentrations like percent weight, weight, um, percent volume, volume. These things, at least they're per, like true percentages because they're dividing things like to have the same units. Percent weight volume is just weird because it's not, a percent if you're dividing two different things like grams and milliliters. But anyway, this is often sometimes used. Um, and so this percent weight volume is um, recognized as grams per 100 mils. So 1% weight, weight volume would be one grams per 100 mil. So if we were going back to our our cookie concentrations, this would be like grams of your chocolate chips per 100 milliliters of batter. So if you had one gram of chocolate chips per 100 mil batter, that would be 1% um, weight volume um, chocolate chip solution. Um, and so why is, the, where did the heck did this thing come from? And so this 1% weight volume, one gram per 100 mil, this comes from the fact that water has a density of a gram per mil at room temp, and adding a little bit of a solute won't work that, won't change that. So the density of most biological solutions is close to the density of pure water, so it's close to a gram per, um, a, per milliliter. So if the, we were to say that there's 100 grams of something else in a milliliter, and the solution still had the density of a gram per mil, it would have to mean that the solution was 100% your thing. So one grams per mil would be 100% weight volume. And therefore, 1% would be one gram per 100 mils. Um, but for this to hold true, the thing you're adding has to be similar to the density of water. You know, there's just so little of it compared to water that it's not going to really make a dent. So a place where we might see percent weight volume. So in the lab, we commonly see this when we're talking about like percentages of gel. So like percentage of an agarose gel. So agarose gel electrophoresis, we make these um, sugar gels that we can separate DNA fragments by size by running them through this gel using electricity. And it's going to, the gel is going to slow down the bigger fragments more so we can separate them by size. We often want to make like a 1% gel or that sort of thing. And so we would weigh out one gram and dissolve it in 100 milliliters of water. And this is basically um, one of the main ways where I, how I can remember that 1% weight volume equals one gram per 100 mils. Um, we also see this sometimes with like APS solutions, various things like that. Um, so why is this is often comes up this weight percent weight volume. You often see it in medicine. Um, and like IV fluids. So normal saline is this um, salt solution that's reported as 0.9% weight volume. But what would be the true concentration of it? So how about in molarity? So I love molarity. Um, let's deal with molarity. So sodium chloride has a formula weight of 58.44 grams per mole. Um, and so if we do this dimensional analysis, 
we divide the grams by the molecular weight or by this formula weight um, because it's one of those electrolytes. Now we're going to get 0.015 mole of sodium chloride. And if we have 100 mil, now we have we can use that unit conversion to 0.1 mil liter. And so our molarity is going to be about 0.15 molar NaCl in your 0.9% um, solution. We can also do it in terms of percent weight weight. And so if we were to do this, we would find out that we have about 0.89% sodium chloride, which is why we can kind of use um, it see you or close to that 0.9%, um, which is the more legitimate thing because at least we're doing percent weight weight. So we have the same units. So lots of ways to think about molecules and hopefully it also helps you think like a molecule because I think that thinking like molecules not only makes things more fun, but it also helps you really get an intuitive sense about what's going on in molecular circumstances and to really kind of grasp why reactions happen the way they do, why molecules do what they do, um, and really raise interesting questions and drive you to think more creatively.